Planet America's fake news. What the hell is going on here? Good evening and welcome to television. Planet America, to be precise. Hello, I'm John Barron. And I'm Chester Chidello. This week, the president at war with the top brass in the Navy. Talking about war, the CIA's former top Russia expert says we could be stumbling into World War III. Once a shooting war starts, uh, it would be very hard to prevent it from escalating to a catastrophic nuclear exchange. Woo! Happy Thanksgiving! In the History Department this week, how the teddy bear got its name. And we're going to check up on Trump's promise to... Build that wall! Build that wall! But first... This week, the impeachment inquiry moved from the House Intelligence Committee to the Judiciary Committee, which will hold its first hearings next week. It's Judiciary, chaired by Democrat Jerry Nadler, that will ultimately decide on articles of impeachment to be sent to the floor of the House for a final vote. Meanwhile, the federal court in Washington, D.C. has ruled former White House counsel Donald McGahn must testify. Many believe that McGahn holds the key to possible charges of obstruction of justice against the president over his attempts to shut down the Mueller investigation, which may be included in impeachment articles. Judge Katani Brown-Jackson rejected the Trump administration's claim that presidential advisers like McGahn are immune from being compelled to talk about their official duties saying, Presidents are not kings. They do not have subjects bound by loyalty or blood whose destiny they are entitled to control. The Justice Department is appealing the ruling, which, if it stands, could also see figures at the centre of the Ukraine inquiry, like former National Security Advisor John Bolton and Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, compelled to testify. And that appeal will be heard on January the 3rd, Chaz. And then, if the administration loses that appeal, they'll no doubt keep on going to the Supreme Court, so probably don't expect to hear from them again until the middle of 2020 at the earliest. All right. In other impeachment-related news this week, it was revealed that two officials from the White House Office of Management and Budget resigned in part due to their concerns over the hold-up of military aid to Ukraine. That, according to acting head of the OMB, Mark Sandy. Yeah, the staffers seem to have been worried that the hold being placed on military aid was illegal in itself, quite apart from any quid pro quo issues. Theoretically, the administration's not allowed to defer payments unless there are contingencies, there are changes in requirements, or a laws passed asking them to, and none of those scenarios were in effect with Ukraine. Now, no one's going to press charges about that, of course, but it does go to building the case for a potential abuse of power. It was also reported this week, by the way, that President Trump only released the aid after he was told it was the subject of a formal complaint to Congress. A stunning new report claims President Trump knew about the whistleblower complaint before he released military aid to the Ukraine and before telling Ambassador Gordon Sondland that there was no quid pro quo involved. And this is what the president thinks of all that. They're pushing that impeachment witch hunt and... A lot of bad things are happening to them. Because you see what's happening in the polls? Everybody said, that's really bullshit. Yeah. Oh, well, let's take a look at those yeah. polls, hey? And Trump's actually right that while support for impeachment rocketed up to 48.4% originally, it slowly drifted down to basically dead even by halfway through last week. But since the end of the hearings, it's reverted to about 48% again, which isn't magnificent, but it's not bad either. And if we isolate independents, you can see they too rose to about 47.5% before drifting down to 41%, and now they're at 44.5%. So the polling's not as anti-impeachment as Trump suggests, but if I was a Democrat, I'd still be nervous about those polls, because the Democrats just enjoyed as much control of the process as they're ever going to have. It's all uphill from here, and there are already some warning signs, like these results from Morning Consult. Now, these were admittedly from that low period in the polling last week, but still, independents were saying that impeachment was more important to politicians than to me by 62% to 22%. And they were saying impeachment was more important to the media than to me, 
by 61% to 23%. Now, that's a worry. Gabo gabo. A Justice Department review of the FBI's handling of its investigation into Russian election meddling in 2016 is expected to debunk many accusations made by the President and his allies, including this from March 2017. Hello, has President Obama gone to tap my phones during the very sacred election process? This is Nixon Watergate, bad or sick? The New York Times this week says, according to people familiar with a draft of the Inspector General's report, the FBI did not take politically motivated steps to pursue a secret wiretap against former Trump advisor Carter Page once he'd left the campaign. Inspector General Michael Horowitz also reportedly found no evidence the FBI attempted to place undercover agents or informants inside Trump's campaign in 2016. Yet... The FBI does not escape criticism altogether for errors and omissions in applying for the wiretaps and that the Bureau was careless and unprofessional. So, not a glowing report, but no claim of bias or political motivation. I wouldn't say no bias, though, because if we just go back to that same New York Times article, it refers to one FBI agent who altered an email that officials used when preparing their warrant application for Carter Page. This guy added the material to the bottom of an email that he compiled for another FBI official to read when preparing that application, although it didn't go into the actual application itself. And this guy, Kevin Kleinsmith, seems to have unsurprisingly been shoveled out of the Russian investigation by February last year because he was biased. So that's not great. Mm. Although, admittedly, that guy was a bit of a nobody. And also, if we go back to that same New York Times article one more time, because it seems to be the only source of information in the world at the moment, the IG report apparently will find that the FBI did have enough evidence to justify opening the Russian investigation. And none of that evidence came from the CIA or the Steele dossier. And I say, apparently, because I can't help noticing everything we've just said is based on anonymous leaks in one article of the New York Times. So why don't we see what the actual report says when it's released on December 9, hey? All right, let's do that. There was some upheaval at the Pentagon this week. The Navy Secretary is out. Asked to resign by Defence Secretary Mark Esper over his handling of disgraced Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher. Eddie Gallagher is a member of the elite Navy SEALs who was accused of war crimes by subordinates on a tour of duty in Iraq in 2017. Members of Gallagher's platoon accused him of shooting at civilians, including adolescent girls and old men. On a group chat, Navy sniper Dalton Talbot said he'd shot more warning shots to save civilians from Eddie than he ever did at ISIS. And he saw an issue with that. Gallagher was also accused of killing a captive teenaged Islamic State fighter with a knife, then posing for a photo with his severed head. Despite sending text messages to friends boasting, got him with my hunting knife, Gallagher was acquitted of the most serious war crimes charges after a Navy medic claimed that he had killed the teen by cutting his oxygen supply in an act of mercy after he'd been stabbed. In his July trial, Gallagher was convicted on a single charge of wrongfully posing for an unofficial picture with a human casualty. President Trump was following the case closely as was Fox News. People nationwide wait to see if President Donald Trump will pardon Navy SEAL Chief Edward Gallagher. His defense team and family says their focus is still on the trial, now set for June 10th. And while Gallagher was still awaiting trial, the president called for him to be released from the Navy jail. Eddie Gallagher will soon be moved to less restrictive confinement while he awaits his day in court. Then, when Gallagher was cleared of the most serious of the charges, the president congratulated him and said... Glad I could help. The presidential meddling did not end there, nor, coincidentally, did the interest of Fox News. Navy SEAL Edward Gallagher sentenced on one charge after being acquitted in the murder of an ISIS fighter. In the end, Gallagher was sentenced to four months in prison, but released because he'd already served eight months in the Navy jail. He was demoted from Chief Petty Officer to Petty Officer First Class, but the Navy brass wanted to go a lot further, ordering a review and taking away the trident pin marking Gallagher as a Navy SEAL. Last week, President Trump again stepped in. The Navy will not be taking away warfighter and Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher's trident pen. The president then restored Gallagher's rank 
And that is what led to Navy Secretary Richard Spencer's demise. The Navy Secretary privately proposed to the White House that if officials did not interfere with the Navy review, Spencer would make certain Gallagher could retire with his SEAL membership and the coveted Trident pin. Secretary Esper said in a statement, Unfortunately, as a result, I have determined that Secretary Spencer no longer has my confidence to continue in his position. I wish Richard well. Well, Richard admits that he made a mistake going around his superior, Mark Esper, trying to broker a deal between the White House and the Navy. But then, in a Washington Post op-ed yesterday, he unleashed on the president, describing his, quote, shocking and unprecedented intervention in the Gallagher case and claiming, quote, the president has very little understanding of what it means to be in the military, to fight ethically or to be governed by a uniform set of rules and practices. Look, I don't want to get too much into what happened to the Navy Secretary because I think there's still a lot of questions out there about that. Also, this guy's trial was obviously a mess and Trump has the right to pardon whoever he likes. But there's one pretty sure bet and it's this. What message does that send to the troops? Well, what message does it send? I, that you can get away with things. And if you want to know what he means by you can get away with things, Admiral Green, the guy in charge of disciplining Gallagher, fired a few other SEAL leaders for what he called the Gallagher Effect. So Gallagher made this T-shirt of the Gallagher Effect, started selling it through Instagram, and in his post he thanked Admiral Green and said Green was a moron. And he got away with it. Also, he got away with this just this week. I just get a feeling of embarrassment for my community that Admiral Green is letting the ego get the best of him at this point, um, and he's trying to take my trident because it's, it's all about retaliation. Now that's while he's still in the Navy, under Green's command. It's hard to argue that's not gross insubordination. But forget Gallagher, he's gained all the attention. But I'd like to focus on a different guy. A soldier that Trump pardoned of murder charges before his case was even tried. Now, it's one thing to remedy an injustice that's occurred, but to sweep in before a verdict has even been rendered and before the family, the victim, has the opportunity to find out what happened to their loved one, that to me is a worry. And I know it's not as shiny an object as a Navy secretary engaging in a scrag fight with the president, but to me, that's actually more of a concern. This incredibly long and expensive election campaign leading to the statistically likely re-election of President Trump 2020. Well, it's official. Former Republican New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg is running for president as a Democrat. Mike Bloomberg for president. Jobs creator, leader, problem solver. It's going to take all three to build back a country. The billionaire businessman is plotting an unconventional campaign, skipping early states like Iowa and New Hampshire, which rely on months of on-the-ground organising. Instead, he is unleashing his personal fortune on advertising, splashing $33 million in a week. That is around the entire cash on hand of the best-funded campaign out there, Bernie Sanders. Bloomberg is also pouring between $15 and $20 million into a voter registration drive in battleground states. And this is where Bloomberg's campaign may be about more than just a long-shot vanity campaign for president by a rich guy. As Business Insider pointed out this week, Bloomberg will get more bang for his buck attacking Trump as a candidate than he would spending through a super PAC. Candidates, because they have limited funds, super PACs on the other hand, unlimited funds, so TV stations in places like Iowa tend to charge their lowest possible rate for candidates. So, for example, Hillary Clinton paid $1,500 per spot in 2016, while the Right to Rise Super PAC backing Jeb Bush was charged double that, $3,000, during the same time slot. So the big question is whether Bloomberg simply wants to target Trump or whether at some stage he does attack fellow Democrats. He clearly wants to stop Sanders and Warren. You can tell that. But will he turn his guns or his money on centrists like Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg. We will see, Chaz. Well, what we are seeing, John, is, as you said, Bloomberg is pursuing a very odd strategy here. Forget Iowa and New Hampshire. He's not even seriously contesting the first four states in the primaries, a tactic that has literally never once worked in modern primaries. And Bloomberg's not taking any donations either. He's just using his own money. What that means is he won't have the number of donors required to qualify for democratic debates, even if he does poll well, then that's a scenario that Bloomberg seems oddly complacent about. 
It's up to the DNC, he said. If they set the rules where I qualify, I would certainly debate. If they set the rules where I don't qualify, then I won't. OK, so we'll see how that works out, especially since Bloomberg's money comes with its own complications, like Bloomberg having donated to a whole bunch of Republicans over the years as well, including Dan Donovan and Peter King as recently as 2018. And he also, by the way, endorsed and held a fundraiser for Republican Scott Brown when he ran against Elizabeth Warren in 2012. And that antipathy for Elizabeth Warren seems to be continuing to this day in ways that may not be helpful in a Democratic primary. For instance, his reaction to Warren's wealth tax is, it's called Venezuela. Neither would it be helpful that Bloomberg did as much as anyone to thwart Obama's plans to close down Gitmo. When Bloomberg turned against the 9-11 Masterminds trial being held in New York, it was a huge political blow for Obama's plans to close Gitmo. So much of a blow, in fact, that it eventually killed off those plans entirely. So, no shortage of material for Bloomberg's opponents, John. Indeed not. National polls, though, do continue to show former Vice President Joe Biden dominating this Democratic field and Senator Elizabeth Warren slipping back. Six weeks ago, Warren briefly overtook Biden in the average of polls. Now, she's been overtaken by Bernie Sanders, who's back in second spot. Pete Buttigieg has surged more than two points in the past week. He is now in double digits nationally. Kamala Harris continues to fade away, with Yang and Bloomberg the only candidates above 2% on average nationally. The early state polls are still not looking too good for Biden, though. Much better for Buttigieg and Bernie. Another Iowa poll this week put Mayor Pete in top spot, leading Warren by seven points, with Biden coming a distant fourth, at according to Iowa State. There were two polls to come out of second to vote New Hampshire this week as well. Sanders leading Pete with Warren and Biden tied on 14, followed by Gabbard and Yang. That according to an Emerson poll, a tighter race according to Suffolk, with Sanders leading Warren by two, then Pete, Biden and Gabbard also at six. Yang ahead of Harris, Booker and Tom Steyer. Meanwhile, Joe Biden continues to dominate in places like Nevada and South Carolina. But the real reason for his front-runner status nationally is polls like this from California, which has three times as many delegates as the first four primary states combined. According to Survey USA, Joe Biden leads Sanders by 10 points in California, then Warren, Harris and Buttigieg. And for those keeping count, Chaz, Super Tuesday is... 96 days away. Iowa in just 68 days. Just to hammer home those poll movements you just mm. mentioned, these are the real clear politics averages for the last three months. You can see Biden and Sanders holding pretty steady there, as they tend to do. Kamala Harris is continuing her slow journey towards zero. Warren flew up and is now flying down. And there is Pete Buttigieg nicking a lot of Warren's support and slowly rising. But... He's still miles away from the leaders, and we shouldn't forget that. No, indeed. We've talked quite a bit about Pete Buttigieg's problem attracting black voters this week. That task got a lot harder when somebody dug up comments that he'd made when he was running for mayor of South Bend in 2011. Kids need to see evidence that education's going to work for them, right? And there are a lot of kids, especially the lower income minority neighborhoods, who literally just haven't seen it work. There isn't somebody they know personally and I think that's uh, who testifies to the so value of education. Now, while a comment about a lack of educational role models being a problem in disadvantaged and minority communities is hardly unusual. It did not go down well coming from an Ivy League educated white guy like Pete. Black author and commentator Michael Harriet led a chorus of criticism. He called Buttigieg a lying MF. Look that one up. Buttigieg responded that his 2011 comment does not reflect the totality of his understanding then and certainly now about the obstacles students of colour face in our system today. But then Buttigieg did something else. He called Harriet up on the telephone and according to Harriet, who was rather impressed, he didn't try and explain or talk him around. Instead, he listened to Harriet. That's a novel concept, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, politician that listens. <laughs> we'll never catch on. And uh, Buttigieg isn't the only one having education policy issues. Elizabeth Warren has a group of charter school enthusiasts who are following her around at the moment. They, they're, they're saying that she wants to deprive them of the choices that she enjoyed when she sent her kids to private school. You don't have the same choice that you make for your kids because I read that your children went to private school. No, much, much public school. 
Well, it took about a day before Conservatives had dug up yearbook photos of her son from two different private schools. So then Warren's campaign cut their losses and came clean and admitted that her son went to private schools from after the time he finished the fifth grade. Another own goal for Warren. But regardless of all this stuff, it's pretty clear who gained momentum out of the last debate. Biden and Warren, they, they did OK. Sanders surprisingly lost a little bit of support, but the big winner was Pete Buttigieg, who now has over 6% more people willing to consider supporting him after his debate performance. Andrew Yang, by contrast, has his eyes on a different set of figures. These ones that show that he only spoke for six minutes during the last debate. That's like 60% of the time that Cory Booker got even though Yang polls higher than Booker. And that wasn't a one-off. When you add up all the debates together, Yang has spoken 15 minutes less than you would expect. By contrast, Warren has spoken 14 minutes more than you would expect. Booker, Harris and Buttigieg have all done well out of the debates as well. But here's a surprise. Joe Biden has also been largely ignored, despite being a front-runner for pretty much every debate. I guess Yang and Biden aren't quite as assertive as the rest. But it's led to a bit of bad blood between Andrew Yang and MSNBC. Because MSNBC has also been leaving Yang off all kinds of graphics and generally ignoring him to the point that when they got him on to talk about domestic terrorism, well, they only maintained their attention for a very short period of time. Well, I spoke to an anti-hate activist who talked about how he got indoctrinated into a hate group when he was younger. And he said that the, what would have kept him from that path is if someone else had reached out to him in, in his youth, whether it be a coach or a mentor. Andrew Yang, or... I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are going to go live now to Las Vegas where we are hearing uh, from Senator Bernie Sanders. So that, we... uh, that was Bernie Sanders, the other guy MSNBC ignores. So that's like a super ignore for Yang. In fact, MSNBC don't even seem to know who Andrew Yang is. And John Yang living his best life, uh, crowd surfing, Andrew Yang, excuse me, crowd surfing on the campaign trail. Note, by the way, that even the Chiron got that wrong, so Yang's not a huge fan of their work. Finally, to Yang's fellow ignoree, Joe Biden, who we tend to focus on for gaffes, but Biden's real challenge is about to begin. Like I said earlier, the expected Senate impeachment trial in January is going to be an absolute hunter-thon, non-stop Hunter Biden bashing. And it's fair to say Joe doesn't take that very well. This week, for example, we found out that Hunter Biden has himself a love child from a drug-induced fling with a stripper. And it's fair to say Joe didn't really enjoy being asked about that by Fox News reporter Pete Ducey. I'm wondering if you have a comment on this report and court filing out of Arkansas that your son Hunter just made you a grandfather in. No, that's a private matter. I have no comment. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank the US Constitution, you have to be at least 35 years of age to be President of the United States. And given the average life expectancy in 1788 was 36 and a half, that left a very small window. Of course, that figure was distorted by high infant mortality in the 1780s, but most American presidents have been in their 50s. Not including Trump, only two presidents were in their 70s by the time they left office. The current crop of 2020 US presidential hopefuls includes candidates who would be the oldest and youngest ever commanders in chief. 78 year old Bernie Sanders, 77 year olds Mike Bloomberg and Joe Biden and 70 year old Elizabeth Warren. Then there's 37 year old Pete Buttigieg and 38 year old Tulsi Gabbard. And they're all running to replace 73 year old Donald Trump who was the oldest ever elected president heading towards his 71st birthday when he was sworn in. That's old, and the only other presidents elected after the typical male retirement age of 65 had, shall we say, issues? America's 40th president, Ronald Reagan, was just shy of 70 when he took the title of the oldest ever in 1981. 
that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The former Hollywood actor, Democrat and union leader had become a Republican governor of California in the 60s, leading a conservative revolution. All of us need to be reminded that the federal government did not create the states. The states created the federal government. Reagan, the great communicator, took America towards victory in the Cold War by making expensive preparations for a very hot nuclear war. But heading into his re-election, Reagan's age was an issue, particularly after a bad debate showing against Democrat rival Walter Mondale. White House officials released the results of Reagan's last medical examination. They show him to be in better shape than most men his age. And Reagan himself went out of his way to deny that he ran out of steam during last Sunday's debate. <laughs> I wasn't, no, I wasn't tired. And uh, with regard to the age issue and everything, if I had as much makeup on as he did, I'd have looked younger too. Still, family and close advisors were worried. And when Reagan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease five years after leaving office, some believed the signs were there in the White House. The oldest president before Reagan was William Henry Harrison, who was just over 68 when he was sworn in in 1841. Harrison's age was also an issue during his 1840 campaign. So, to prove his youthful vitality, he did something unusual. He took to the hustings himself, making personal appearances at rallies and making speeches. Prior to that, candidates had considered it gauche to campaign for themselves. Harrison further proved his modernity by being the first president to travel to Washington on a railroad train. And on his inauguration day, March 4, 1841, he pledged limited government and in deference to his age, he promised to serve just one four-year term. He needn't have bothered. President Harrison had given an almost two-hour inaugural address without overcoat or gloves, again to try and show his vigour, whether it was the weather or all those handshakes, President Harrison caught a nasty cold. As he got to work in the White House, his illness got worse and soon developed into pneumonia. 31 days later, he was dead, the first president to die in office. In total, there have been 10 presidents who came to office in their 60s. History, though, suggests being in your 50s is the presidential sweet spot. 26 presidents have been elected or appointed between the ages of 50 and 59. Just nine have been in their 40s, including the youngest ever, Theodore Roosevelt, who was the vice president heading towards his 43rd birthday when President William McKinley was felled by an anarchist's bullet at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. Teddy Roosevelt, who had been a sickly child, advocated what he called the strenuous life of toil and effort, of labour and strife, not to shrink from danger and hardship and win splendid ultimate triumph. Roosevelt had famously charged up Cuba's San Juan Hill with his volunteer cavalry unit, the Rough Riders, during the Spanish-American War. That was unusual, given he'd been a member of McKinley's cabinet before quitting to go a-fighting in Cuba. In office, he literally wrestled and boxed with staff members, even learning jiu-jitsu. He devoured a dozen eggs for breakfast and gulped gallons of coffee. Fair to say, Teddy Roosevelt was quite a guy. A big game hunter who's best remembered now for one of the few animals he didn't kill. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. So the story goes, in November 1902, President Roosevelt was on a bear hunting trip in Mississippi. There was some happy hunting, but the president hadn't bagged a bear. His aides worried that wouldn't look good, so they caught a brown bear and tied him to a willow tree for the president to shoot. But Roosevelt was appalled. He felt it was extremely unsportsmanlike. Newspapers reported the story, the big game hunting president who refused to kill a tethered bear. The Washington Post cartoonist Clifford Berryman drew a picture of the scene, with Teddy drawing the line at killing a small bear. A Brooklyn candy store owner with a side hustle in stuffed toys, Morris Mitchum, saw that cartoon and along with his wife Rose, they made some small stuffed bears in tribute to the president. They called them Teddy's Bear. And they flew off the shelves. More than a century later, children are still being given teddy bears. As for Teddy Roosevelt, the strenuous life caught up with him. Less than a decade after leaving office, he contracted what were described as jungle diseases on his manly world travels. He died from a blood clot at the age of 60. Proof, perhaps, that youth and vigour is no guarantee of presidential longevity.
big, beautiful world. Now, you might remember about a year ago, there was a wee bit of a crisis going on. Mexican drug lords, MS-13 gang members, sex traffickers. Do they run our border, or do we? Okay. If that caravan isn't stopped, the thousands will become millions. Overwhelming hospitals, schools, social services, and law enforcement. Right. Pouring into our country, laughing at our laws, and living off your tax dollars. A okay. five-year-old girl raped by an illegal... OK, we get it. Unauthorised immigration, to be fair, is a problem. There are over 300,000 asylum seekers waiting for their case to be heard right now. And as for total immigration cases, we're talking over a million people in the queue waiting for their day in court. That's a waiting time of almost two years. Yeah. And while that queue exists at the moment, we've still seen the highest number of apprehensions on the southern border since 2007. This all came to a head in May, right there, when this year's border apprehensions were more than twice the number of previous years. But then, things changed. The numbers dropped right off, and last month, there were as few apprehensions as there'd been for ages. So I guess Trump was right about build that, that wall. wall. Build that wall. Build that wall. Except build that wall. They haven't build built the wall, wall yet. Go, go, no wall, no wall. Go! Look, there have been 78 miles of wall built, but it's all replacing old walls. They've just started building a section of new wall right now, but it's only eight miles long. And besides, the people smugglers have already worked out that they can saw right through that wall using a saw that you can get from hardware stores for as little as $100. No, 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 not the ABC, guys. It's not that crap of the cricket, OK? So why are the apprehension numbers falling? Well, firstly, there's the Remain in Mexico program. Now, that's where new asylum seekers are sent to Mexico to wait for their court date. It's now servicing over 55,000 migrants, most of whom have chosen to abandon their claims. Some say that's because their claims were rubbish all along, whilst others say it's because 23% of them are threatened with physical violence in Mexico. And over half of those threatened end up being attacked. Either way, it's been going for months and it seems to be working. So now they're extending Remain in Mexico to include the Arizona border as well. By the way, that's the program's proper name. Uh, hopefully they can add some security funding while they're at it, maybe. Another rule which might be having an impact as well, is the safe third party rule. Now this states that an asylum seeker who enters America without first applying for protection in the countries that they pass through to get to America becomes ineligible for asylum. Now, this rule's just come into effect. The first Honduran asylum seeker who was sent from America to Guatemala under this rule just last week. But it's been getting huge publicity in Central America for months. So could be having an effect. It is the subject of a court challenge, I should say, but at least so far, it's happening. And finally, after Trump threatened them with tariffs, Mexico has deployed troops to its southern border to crack down on migrant caravans. And that might be working as well. So say what you want about Trump not being very nice, but he has gotten on top of Central American unauthorised immigration. The problem is, that might be about to change. Cartel wars have seen Mexican murders surge to a record high. In fact, in some parts of the country, the cartels are now effectively the real authorities. So what this means is that Mexican asylum-seeking immigration is probably about to make a comeback. There's a lot of Mexicans out there, and none of these ideas we just said work for Mexico. So Build what are you wall. going to... Oh, Build God. that wall! Yes. Build that wall! Build Big, that wall. beautiful world. We've seen a lot of career diplomats trooping up to Capitol Hill in recent weeks to raise their concerns about the Trump administration's handling of Ukraine policy. In the background of all of this, of course, is the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Crimea. According to our guest this week, there is a real danger of events spiralling out of control into a major conflict between Russia and the United States. 
For many years, George Beebe was the CIA's top Russia analyst. He was also senior Russia advisor to Vice President Cheney during the Bush administration. He's author of the new book, The Russia Trap, how our shadow war with Russia could spiral into catastrophe. George Beebe, welcome to Planet America. My pleasure. George, it seems that there are kind of two schools of thought about Vladimir Putin's Russia. One, that he's a, another Hitler-like expansionist who needs to be stopped. The other is that Russia is really in a defensive crouch and they need to be accommodated by NATO and their allies. Who's right in that, do you think? Well, actually, I think um, each of these schools of thought is correct to some degree. I, I wouldn't come down on the side of either one of them. And that's part of the reason why dealing with Russia is such a difficult challenge. Uh, there are certainly elements of, of offensive uh, motivation in what Russia is doing in the world. And I think that largely is a result of Russia's history, uh, its self-conception as a great power, um, and its belief that it really can't be uh, Russia uh, intact in its current borders unless it is a great power. There are lots of complex uh, historical, cultural, and psychological reasons, I think, for that perspective. But um, it believes that it has to radiate power outward into its immediate neighborhood. It has to dominate its neighbors, um, as uh, Russia believes all great powers do, including the United States. Um, so there is definitely an, an offensive aspect to what Russia is about in the world. Okay, so given that, do you think there's anything especially difficult about Putin in particular, or are the problems that you're seeing with the American-Russian relationship likely to persist even under future Russian leaders? Well, uh, certainly Putin is somebody that has been in power uh, for a long time. Uh, he's, uh, unless I'm wrong, uh, the international statesman with the most experience that's playing in, on the, uh, the world stage today. So he's seen an awful lot of fellow statesmen come and go. He's dealt with uh, a lot of key issues in the world for quite some time. Uh, he knows what he's doing and for that reason I think he's a formidable player. Um, do I think he's particularly aggressive and expansionist? relative to uh, the center of gravity in Russia uh, today and historically? No, I don't. I, I don't think he's an outlier. I think Putin is basically a, a reflection of the center of gravity within Russia politically. George, the last three American presidents now have had high hopes of a constructive relationship with Russia at the start of their presidencies, but by the end of their presidencies, the relationship has degraded every single time. Why is Russia so difficult to deal with? The analogy that I use in the book is World War I. Uh, what happened during World War I, this wasn't a case of a, an expansionist power in Europe that was bent on grabbing as much territory as it could until it faced opposition. This was a, a, a change in societies in Europe at the grassroots level that had implications for the regimes on the continent that were quite profound. There was a changing uh, balance of power that was going on uh, in the continent. Um, old ways of maintaining order, the, the concert of Europe started to break down and Europe devolved into a, a very rigid set of alliances uh, that made handling small problems a lot more difficult. It amplified problems rather than uh, mitigated them. And, and on top of this, there were new technologies, railway technologies that gave decided advantages to states, armies that mobilized first. So all these things combined to produce a disaster that no one saw coming. And I think to a degree, that's the sort of dynamic that we're seeing in the relationship with Russia right now. This combination of new technologies, alliances, changing international power balances, um, old rules of the game, arms control agreements and confidence building measures that helped to stabilize the Cold War that are all going away right now. So the breaks that can um, mitigate these escalatory spirals aren't really there anymore. So George, what is the modern equivalent of the shooting of an Archduke in Sarajevo? How and where could World War III start? Well, uh, the disturbing thing is that it's not hard to identify a whole bunch of factors that could have that kind of effect. Certainly Ukraine is one that I would look at because it's so central to, to Russia's national security interests. 
uh, geographically right in the middle of Europe, a lot of players involved there, but essentially you have the United States on the one hand and Russia on the other hand engaged in an indirect proxy uh, war going on right there. And things could easily get out of hand. It's not hard to imagine how uh, some of the, the militias that are at work there that aren't really under the control of any side could do some things that, that might cause uh, an escalatory spiral. Uh, Iran is another one. Uh, clearly the United States and, uh, and Russia have much different perspectives on Iran, uh, how to deal with that challenge, uh, how to deal with Iran's role in the region. Um, and uh, a lot of emotions involved, the stakes are high. Uh, the cyber arena is another one. This is one where um, the nature of cyber technology incentivizes uh, offensive operations. Um, and it's not at all clear how you prevent those offensive operations from not spilling over into the uh, bricks and mortar world in ways that could be quite destabilizing. We haven't paid enough attention to how we mitigate those dangers. We need to be talking about how to handle those. Right now, of course, George, America has a president who is elected by a razor-thin majority with the concerted assistance of Russia because of their hacking of the DNC and the Clinton campaign and an information warfare campaign carried out online. How do you feel about that? Well, um, I think, first of all, there's no question that the Russians interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Um, now, why that interference occurred is a different matter, and I, I think uh, we need to have a much deeper uh, discussion about what the motivations were on uh, Russia's part for doing this. Um, the question of how much impact that had on uh, President Trump's election is, is another matter altogether. And I have to say I'm quite skeptical that the, uh, the Russians had a substantial impact on uh, the, the way that election turned out. Um, and uh, to some degree, I think it's a distraction to talk about uh, Russian involvement in that election outcome uh, because it, it uh, interferes in our domestic ability to address some important considerations politically here. Uh, why was it that much of uh, uh, the working class in uh, middle America decided to vote for Trump? Uh, I think those are the kinds of questions that we have to address in order to get our, our own domestic political act in order. Uh, address some problems that both parties, uh, Republican and uh, Democrat, have been unwilling to address prior to 2016 and that we need to be talking more about. Well, George Beebe, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Planet America. My pleasure. Thank you. Gobble, gobble. And with that, we are right out of time. Happy Thanksgiving to our American and expat viewers and to just those who like eating pumpkin pie like Why me. Do you get the real hat and I get <laughs> this. Because I'm nice to the props department. Uh, anyway, I'm thankful that Dr. David Smith will be here for the Planet Extra on iView and Facebook because certain people are too busy buying novelty <laughs> items. <laughs> so, Bye -bye. Yeah. Gobble, gobble.